Uh, good morning. Happy New Year. Um, it is a privilege to worship with you this morning in the study of God's Word to fill in for Mark, especially this first Sunday of 2024. Um, and uh, our text this morning here is, is as Warren uh, referenced, Psalm 117. Psalm 117. And as you're turning there, um, I think it's, it's worthy to look back on the past year, this past year, and as a church family, um, in our own lives, in your own lives, in, your own, in our own immediate families, um, we have so much to be grateful for um, and so much cause to praise, uh, to praise the Lord and all the ways he's, he's blessed us, he's guided us, protected us, delivered us, guarded us uh, in his providence day to day provided uh, for all our needs. We are here this morning uh, because of his great mercy, um, both in the larger experiences of our lives in this past year and even in the minute details that you would think are, are seemingly minute. Uh, all in the things that have been seen, uh, what we see, and, and all that we can't even, we don't even realize or we don't see. Um, much cause for thanksgiving, much cause for praise. That's certainly true for my family uh, in 2023. Um, and I know it's true for you as well, for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, we see the providence of God each and every day um, as we look for it. Uh, and, and even greater, by God's grace, all the promises and eternal blessings that we have are found in and reflected in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all those blessings, the eternal blessings of God, and all His promises are ours in Him, uh, in full, through faith. Um, these things are worth considering as we open in our text and reflect upon. It gives us great cause to praise, not only what He has done, but for who He is, for who He is in His nature and character. And indeed, the Lord is praiseworthy. He is worthy of all praise. That's the text this morning in Psalm 117. It's a psalm of praise, a call to praise. <clears throat> Turn with me here, or you'll miss it. <laughs> psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all nations. Laud Him, all peoples. For his loving kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord is everlasting. Praise the Lord. Well, that's Psalm 117 in its entirety. It's short but sweet, small but mighty. Certainly great things come in small packages. We tell our children that over the Christmas season as they open small gifts. Wives, you have on your finger a small um, gift that came in a small package, your wedding ring, but most certainly it's great. It represents something great. That's what this psalm is. Uh, Spurgeon puts it in this way. This psalm, which is very little in its letter, is exceedingly large in its spirit. For bursting beyond all bounds of race and nationality, it, causes, it calls all mankind to praise the name of the Lord. Psalm 117 is neatly and perfectly nestled in between Psalm 116 and Psalm 118. Six before seven and eight after. Um, Psalm 117, uh, this tiny chunk. Uh, Psalm 116 is a thanksgiving of praise to the Lord for his deliverance. It begins, I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my supplication. Gracious, verse 5, is the Lord, and righteous. Yes, our God is compassionate. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully for you, with you. For you have rescued my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. And it concludes with an exhortation to the people of Israel to praise. 
In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Israel, praise the Lord. And then fast forward to Psalm 118, an exhortation to the people of Israel to thanksgiving and praise to the Lord for his salvation and for his goodness. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let Israel say, his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let the house of Aaron say, his loving kindness is everlasting. Verse 14, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Bruce Walkie taught on Psalm 117. Uh, it's in the chapel archives. If you have some time this week, I recommend you listen to it. I, I can't even begin to, to mirror what, what he has taught um, and how he has expounded upon that message. Such a wonderful exposition of the psalm. Dr. Walkie points out how some have treated, or rather mistreated, Psalm 117 due to its brevity as an incomplete fragment um, or without any independent character on its own. Some manuscripts, he points out, have Psalm 117 placed at the end, tacked on to the end of Psalm 116, and other scribes um, have it copied at the beginning of Psalm 118. However, most rec manuscripts recognize Psalm 117 as a distinct and independent. It stands on its own. Um, it is indeed a call to praise, a cause to praise, and it has a proper conclusion, as Dr. Walkie points out. In its entirety, it's a full and complete psalm. It's rich with meaning and implication and application for us today. Um, it's a psalm of praise to the Lord suitable for every occasion, and especially for us here um, as Gentiles. Um, what do I mean by that? If you notice, Psalm 116 addresses the Lord's house. It addresses Jerusalem, the Lord's chosen people of Israel. That's Psalm 116. Psalm 117 again addresses, I'm sorry, 118 again addresses the Lord's covenant people, the people of Israel. Oh, let Israel say, oh, let the house of Aaron say. But here we have a distinct, in Psalm 117, a distinct and separate audience in view. Uh, the exhortation is directed to the nations, a global exhortation to worship the one true God who is the covenant God of Israel, that is Yahweh. Verse 1, praise the Lord. You'll notice it's all caps. Praise the Lord, all nations. Laud him, all peoples. Praise the Lord. That's Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. In the opening line, we get the word hallelujah. Um, hallel, or the joyous praise in song. And then the second part, the Yah is a shortened form of Yahweh or Jehovah. But here we have it in full. Praise the Lord. Praise Yahweh. Here is where Psalm 116 and Psalm 117 and 118 are all alike. They are each distinct calls to worship and praise directed solely to the covenant God of Israel, the Lord, Yahweh the proper name of the God of Israel, his covenant name. You know the account very well in Exodus chapter 3. The Lord reveals himself to the fugitive Moses in a blazing fire in the midst of a bush. He reveals himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, uh, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses specifically asks for a name his name. What, what do I call you? What do I say is the name of the one who sent me when your people ask? The Lord replied, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. That's Yahweh. The Lord continues, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh or the Lord 
The God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial name to all generations. That's Yahweh. Um, I am who I am. There's no vowels there. It's known as the uh, tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H. Um, you, you already know, know this. And the God's covenant name, we're pointed to his nature. We're pointed to his character in his very name. The God of Israel is eternal, the great I am. There is no beginning of his being. And as such, the Lord does not change. The Lord God of Israel, Yahweh, does not change. That is, he is immutable. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as such, the implications are great, and they're really clear. The Lord does not grow in his knowledge or power. He is omniscient. He is om om omnipotent. That is, he is all-knowing and all-powerful. He is sovereign over his creation. He is infinite. He is holy, meaning that he is separate in every way from us as his creation, as his creature, altogether other. Um, you're familiar with the term the aseity of God or the nature of God's self-existence. It's wrapped up in that name, Yahweh, I am that I am. Uh, his absolute self-sufficiency. He is wholly independent without any external cause or source. And all of this and even more is wrapped up in that name of Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, the Lord Jehovah. And yet the amazing thing is, here we cannot even begin to grasp the depths of the knowledge of God, and yet he has made himself known. Um, he has revealed himself to us, his man, to mankind, to his, his creation, his creature, and even greater, his fallen creation, his fallen creature. And it is not merely Israel who is called to praise, um, but the call of praise extends to the nations, to all the nations, to all peoples. That's verse 1. Praise the Lord, all nations. Laud him, all peoples. Now we need to understand the phrase, praise the Lord properly here um, in this text. It's an imperative. It's not an exclamation of praise, as we would commonly use with one another. Uh, perhaps you have a, a prayer request and you share uh, the affirming answer that the Lord has, has given. And, and you would say, you know, in your mind or even out loud or perhaps replying in the text, hallelujah or praise the Lord. Um, that's an exclamation of praise um, we often will use, but rather here is an imperative. It's not merely an invitation. It's not merely a global invitation. It's a global admonition. It's a global command to all nations to praise the covenant God of Israel, a command to all peoples to laud him, to glorify him or to honor him and only him. Again, the implications are, are far reaching and they're, they're clear. The first implication is that the God of Israel is the only one true God. He alone is worthy of praise for he alone is true. He alone is the great I am. There is no other. All other objects of worship, of praise, um, uh, all, all other objects of worship created by the hands or the imaginations of mankind are but idolatry, vain idolatry, and hopeless futility. That's the efforts of the nations to worship God in their own uh, imaginations. The gods of the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hittites. If you consider the ancient gods of, Israel, of Egypt, of Assyria, of Babylon, among the Greeks and among the Romans, where are they all today? What has become of them? It is all of vanity and futility. Uh, and their way is hopelessness 
And ultimately, their way is death. And we see that equally true in the futility of the idol worship that we see in the world today. Uh, Not only is that path futile, it's ultimately fatal. All but the worship of the one true God, which is Yahweh, the God of Israel. The second implication is more positive. It's a call to the nations to praise Yahweh. And in that call to praise, there would be a cause to praise. The Lord wouldn't call the nations to Israel without giving them a cause to praise him. That's what we see in the praise psalm, a cause to praise, that the blessing would not be restricted merely to Israel, to God's chosen people, but that God's grace and his mercy would extend beyond God's covenant people, that nation of Israel. And even through Israel, the nations would be blessed. That's the very first promise Yahweh uh, gives to Abraham as he calls him out um, to be his own. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, then Abram, he will say, "I, I will bless those, I will bless those who bless you. And the the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all families of the earth will be blessed. Right from the start, the promise to to Abraham, to Abram, is that he would make him a blessing to the nations, uh, that all the families of the earth would be blessed. Again, in Abraham, uh, uh, to Abraham in Genesis, Chapter 22, verse, 13, uh, verse 18. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. The promise is repeated again to Jacob in Genesis chapter 24. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 18. No, I'm wrong. Genesis 28, verse 14. Um, your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you, all your descendants, shall all uh, the families of the earth be blessed. It's interesting how the Lord uses the nations, the great disbursement of the Jews, in turn is a blessing to the Gentiles, to the nations. Moses in Deuteronomy 32, verse 43, prophesied in the same way. Rejoice, O nations, with his people. Isaiah 11, verse 10. The nations will uh, resort to the root of Jesse. Who will stand as a signal for for the peoples? And his resting place will be glorious. We see the extension of God's grace and mercy Uh, to the Gentile nations foreshadowed all throughout the Old Testament. That call to worship and praise is given. Um, Indeed, it is willed. We see it in the life of Ruth, the Moabitess, and her words to Naomi, where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may Yahweh, thus may the Lord Yahweh do to me and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. Consider Rahab, the harlot of Jericho, who assisted the Israelite spies um, in Joshua 2. Her name is among that great hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. A little-known character, Ittai the Gittite, in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verses 19 through 23, the scene is that King David, the anointed one of God, is fleeing his son Absalom. All seems lost. David urges Ittai directly as a foreigner to return to his homeland, to return to his brothers. Ittai answers David, As Yahweh, as the Lord lives, and as my Lord the King lives, surely wherever my King, wherever my Lord the King may be, 
whether in death or in life, there your servant will be. Almost the same words as Ruth. Numbers chapter 32, verse 12. You know Caleb, but did you know he was the son of a, a Kenez, Kenizzite? That's one of the Canaanite tribes. Or consider the entire people of Nineveh. In Jonah chapter 3, indeed God's salvific plan for the ages, his grace and mercy was not merely limited or to be confined to one covenant nation, but to be extended to all race of men, to every nation and tribe. And that's our psalmist's call here. Praise the Lord, all nations. Laud him, all peoples. That word peoples can be rendered all tribes. Praise the Lord, all nations. Laud him, all you tribes of people. That's not what we see. Is that not what we see in Revelation in the coming age, in the age to come in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10? Worthy are you to take a book, to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with men, uh, for God with your blood, men of every tongue, every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to your God, and they will reign upon the earth. I agree with Spurgeon, who stated, we know and believe that no tribe of men shall be unrepresented in the universal song, which shall ascend unto the Lord of all. What a beautiful picture. Indeed, all, not all without exception, but rather all without distinction will be represented there. I believe from every tongue, tribe, and people, and nation, uh, praising the Lord as one. And now the call to praise is followed by a great cause to praise. Verse 2, for his loving kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord is everlasting. The psalmist provides two great causes for the nations to praise, for the Gentile nations to praise. First, it's the work of God. It's the work of Yahweh. The work of the Lord, for his loving kindness is great toward us. The second cause is for the person of the Lord, for who he is. And the truth of the Lord is everlasting. The psalmist points us first to the work of the Lord. His loving kindness is great toward us. We'll define the us, but first uh, we must define the loving kindness that loving kindness of the Lord. You're familiar with that word as well. It's, it's been repeated here, uh, many teachers uh, before this day, before this text. It's the hesed, uh, God's steadfast love, which he has expressed uh, in his covenant relationship with Israel. It's his loyal love to Israel, which is pictured, that Israel is pictured as a bride. Mark down Isaiah 54, verse 5. You can look later. Or Jeremiah 31, verse 32. Both picture Israel as the bride of Yahweh. For example, Hosea, again, chapter 2, verses 19 through 20, makes it very clear using that same imagery and the same word. I will betroth you to, my, to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness and compassion. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know that I am the Lord, that I am Yahweh. This is the word here, loving kindness. God's steadfast love to his covenant people or his loyal love. His loving kindness is great toward us. The psalmist writes, the word great here is, means mighty in the sense of mighty or strong. The word, to, uh, the word uh, toward can be rendered upon or above or even over. So the picture is the loving kindness of Yahweh 
His loving kindness is strong over us or mighty upon us. The idea here is that the loving kindness of the Lord is prevailing. That's the picture here of the psalm. That's the word that's used, prevailing. His loving kindness prevails over us. Isn't that marvelous? This is the same word used in Exodus chapter 17, verse 11. The picture when Amalek came to fight against Israel at Rephidim. Moses told Joshua to choose his men and go out and fight. Moses stood at the top of the hill. The picture is he has a staff, the staff of God in his hand. And when he holds that staff over his head, uh, in his hand, um, Israel begins to prevail. That's the word that's used. Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. And so Aaron and Hur, who are with Moses, uh, prop Moses up on a rock and they assist in holding his hands up. And when they do, Israel prevails. Joshua prevails. And ultimately it's written, he helped uh, uh, as Moses' hands are up and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek. That's the picture here in the work of Yahweh in his loving kindness. His steadfast loving kindness prevails over us. Indeed, in spite of us. What a picture that is of his irresistible grace. The irresistible grace of God, his loving kindness is effective. It's efficacious um, in turning a stiff-necked, rebellious people unto himself by his grace. And all that's required, even the faith, is granted through the work of regeneration by his prevailing loving kindness. He gives life and breath to the dry, dead bones. The us here in our text is the covenant people of God, not the Gentiles, but the, the writer is calling the, uh, the Gentile nations to praise for the redeeming loving kindness, the prevailing loving kindness that God, the Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel has for Israel. That God's steadfast loving kindness to his covenant people prevails, will prevail, and fully prevail. And it will be a cause of great, joycing, great rejoicing among the Gentile nations. And how great his loyal love will be seen. That's Psalm 103, verse 11. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. Psalm 136 recounts God's enduring faithfulness to Israel and the heritage um, that is promised to Israel. Psalm 136, I remember standing on a Sunday and reading, and the text was read, and each verse, the, the preacher would read the first section of each verse, and then the congregation would repeat the second uh, uh, section of each and every verse of Psalm 136, as it recounts God's enduring faithfulness to Israel. The line is repeated in all 26 verses, for his loving kindness is everlasting. I won't read it every 26 times it's mentioned, um, but that same phrase is seen in Psalm 117 and 118. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And verse two and verse three and verse four repeated. Why is it repeated? If it weren't true, his loving kindness is everlasting. It's never ending. Uh, his covenant people, uh, his loving kindness for his covenant people are pre is prevailing for it is everlasting. And it is everlasting because that's the very nature and character of Yahweh, of God. The loving kindness of the Lord, his grace and his mercy are joined together in who he is. It's inseparable. That's where the psalmist points to the nature of the character of Yahweh, who he is. 
And the truth of the Lord is everlasting. Not only are his promises, ever, his promises are everlasting because he himself is everlasting. He is eternal. The Lord God of Israel, the great I am, with no beginning, no ending, is everlasting. And his truth can be rendered firmness, this word truth, or firmness, or faithfulness. That's the word seen here in truth. It is everlasting, both in antiquity, in eternity past, and in futurity, from age to age in the future, from ages past and present and future, the Lord God is everlasting. And the truth, his truth is everlasting. The word we hold in our hand is everlasting. It is eternal, uh, the eternal truth of God. And it's bound up in his very name. And how can we know this? This is where the psalm points us. How can we know this? That the Lord has revealed, we know this because he has revealed his prevailing loving kindness. And he has revealed his everlasting truth. It's all bound up in what this text is pointing us toward. What all the scriptures, every page of the Old Testament is pointing us towards. The Messiah. In these short few verses, the, uh, it's pointing us to the anointed one of Israel. The Messiah of the Jews would be the savior of the world. Uh, the, the psalm is pointing us to the very person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It points us to the gospel, the good news of who he is as the Messiah. The suffering servant would come uh, and he will be a reigning king. The son of man, the son of David, the root of Jesse. God the son, verse uh, Psalm 118 uh, he is the stone which the builders rejected, and he has become the chief cornerstone. He is the great immutable I am. In Hebrews 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The aseity of God is seen fully in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, very God of very God, and yet humbled himself to become fully man, to represent his people, uh, a people from every tongue, tribe, and nation for himself, to give himself to purchase with his blood a people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the great I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That's John 14, verse 6. For in him, in Jesus Christ, all the fullness of deity, or all the fullness of the Godhead, dwells in bodily form. In him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. That's Colossians 2, verse 9. And it is in the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, where God the Father perfectly reveals his loving kindness in full, there displayed in him at the cross. That's Romans 5, 8. For God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And there is salvation as Acts as declared by Peter in Acts chapter 4, verse 14. <clears throat> there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. It's only through faith in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ for who he is, what he has accomplished at the cross, that any will be declared righteous. For there at the cross, his righteousness, uh, our sin is imputed to him, applied to his account for all who are called to himself. All who trust in him, the sins of the nations, of all the nations, represented from all the nations, from every tribe, all who come to faith and trust in him, their sin is paid in full and put upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And in turn, the righteousness of his son is applied to our account, imputed to us. So when God the Father looks at all who look 
to the Messiah. Uh, all who look to Jesus Christ in faith are reckoned as righteous, a foreign righteousness, a righteousness given in the Son, in the Messiah, in the suffering servant that was declared from the beginning. He would be our Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Well, this psalm gave Paul great cause to praise as he draws this out in Romans, in, his book of, in the book of Romans, <clears throat> uh, the Word of God. Chapter 9, the present condition of Israel is considered. Chapter 10, we see the need of Israel uh, for the gospel. We see their rejection of the Messiah. Um, we see that in chapter 11, Israel's rejection is not total. It's not final. A great revival among the nations, uh, among the nation of Israel is to come. Um, it causes Paul great cause of praise uh, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. If Isaiah, if, if Israel, as referenced as the bride of Christ, would be abandoned, what hope do we have as we are called the bride of Christ who are grafted in to all those promises and blessings? Great repentance among Israel is to come. That's prophesied perfectly, clearly in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. The deity of Christ right there, that they will look upon me. That's the Lord Jesus Christ whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping for the first for a firstborn. The Lord God, Yahweh, will pour out on the house of David and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. That same grace that we are dependent upon. Uh, no merit of our own. In the same way, no merit. In fact, it's in, in spite of us, uh, in spite of our rejection. Psalm, uh, turn with me to... Um, Romans chapter 15. We'll see it here. It will be a great cause to praise when that day comes among the nations of the Gentiles. The gospel from Israel to the Gentiles and then from the Gentiles out of almost a sense of uh, envy uh, returning back to Israel by God's grace. Psalm Fifth, uh, Romans 15. Therefore, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to gl the glory of God. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore, I will give praise to you among the Gentiles, and I will sing your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the nations praise him. That's our psalm this morning. And again, Isaiah says, There shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles hope. Verse 13, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope and by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's really the conclusion of this psalm. A great cause to praise, a great cause to hope, to be filled with joy as we go into this new year. All the blessings, all the all the treasures we have bound up in Christ are ours in full. 
even as adopted sons, into his kingdom, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. What an amazing text. Praise the Lord. That's the, that's the conclusion. Short and sweet. Uh, praise him for who he is, for what he has accomplished in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that every name, every knee will bow. Those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. If you are without him, that's the only source of hope, true hope that we have. True peace with God is found in full in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to him. Trust in him. Put your faith in him and in him alone. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart. You will have not only the peace with God, but you'll have the peace of God. Eternal security is bound up in the one whom he has provided in his own son. Well, I trust all of you here this morning have already done that. And so we go out from here this week as we start the year, the first Sunday of 2024 with that in mind. So I hope you leave here with your mind and heart lifted with great rejoicing, with great praise. We have such great cause to praise. Praise the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. Dear only Father, we thank you for what a treasure we have in this psalm. As a redeemed Gentile church, a people of God, here we have all the rights and privileges that are all bound up and pictured in your Son, in your internal truth, and your loving kindness indeed is everlasting and overwhelming and overcoming, prevailing over us. Grant us the grace as we go from here that our minds and our hearts would be fixed upon um, that great truth. There is no other truth that we can hold uh, greater than that. The assurances that we have in Christ are in full and all the blessings in him. May we look to him as we go out from here that we would be faithful witnesses in gratitude and praise for your work, for what you have done, for sinners such as us, from what you have redeemed us, uh, um, from and what you have redeemed us and purchased us to. A great kingdom. Our hope is in the Lord, uh, from everlasting to everlasting. And we have life in his name. May his name be praised and honored this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.